Utena Koto Katoa, welcome to you all. I'm Charlotte Christensen, a Senior Collection Description Specialist at Te Puna Mātauranga o Aotearoa, National Library of New Zealand. I'm also a member of ORDAC, the Oceania Region RDA Committee, and the current Oceania Representative to the RDA Steering Committee. This is the first of what will be a series of introductory sessions offered by ORDAC, preparing descriptive practitioners for engaging with the official RDA standard by exploring concepts from the RDA guidance. There have been many presentations over the past couple of years on using the toolkit, the website that houses the RDA standard, and those can be looked at for navigational tips. This presentation will instead focus on introducing key concepts which are needed to interact with the standard effectively and efficiently. The topics I cover in these sessions are found within the RDA guidance chapters. I will assume no familiarity with this documentation for the series, so don't worry if you haven't already looked at any of it. I do assume that a large part of the audience for these sessions will be from institutions familiar with original RDA, but following the content of these sessions does not rely on that familiarity. Original RDA is the standard which has become, uh, which has been available for a decade and is in use by many institutions worldwide, primarily libraries. The redesigned version, now available if not yet in general use, is called official RDA. And it's expected that description level training in using official RDA will begin for some institutions later this year. Here's our outline for today's session, which I'll divide into two sections. Firstly, some exploration of introductory material. And secondly, a close inspection of element pages. I'll need to do this at a fairly fast pace to get through it all and leave time for questions at the end. But the session is being recorded, so you can always go back later if something's covered a little too quickly for comfort. A good place to start when first interacting with the RDA guidance chapters is by looking at the objectives and principles of official RDA. RDA is designed to work with the IFLA Statement of International Cataloguing Principles. These principles seek to balance user need with the needs of descriptive staff and their institutions. Considerations such as being responsive to user need, but also to be cost efficient to be accurate and to consider uniformity, but at the same time to think about what is sufficient rather than merely continuing a practice for the sake of continuing. If this looks familiar, it's because original RDA was based on the same set of objectives and principles. This is not a change, it's nothing new, but when considering whether to include or exclude a piece of data for your institution's descriptions, these provide structure to make rational arguments. Similarly familiar, official RDA is concerned with the IFLA user tasks. Original RDA was heavily influenced by the first of the functional requirements models, functional requirements for bibliographic records, also known as FERBA, which had the user tasks find, identify, select, and obtain, sometimes referred to as FISO. The other two functional requirements reports were produced over time with slight differences in their user task names and definitions, and these were also reflected to some degree in original RDA. IFLA have now rationalised all three of these functional requirement models into LRM, the Library Reference Model, which we'll talk about next. But the result for the user tasks is that the FISO set is essentially the same familiar user-based focus that you've seen in original RDA, with the addition of the new task explore, which you are free to explore at your own leisure. To reinforce what I just said, official RDA has LRM as its underlying model. LRM was created out of an amalgamation of the three functional requirement models, but in that process of amalgamation, there were necessarily some clarifications and changes, and that is part of what led to changes between original RDA and official RDA. The theoretical model is not intended to function as a descriptive standard on its own, but it provides a structure that makes it easier for software developers to design systems that can interact with our data. It's worth reinforcing here that while the toolkit is visually different, there was care taken during the three-hour projects that 
the content of instructions remained intact. The exception was where something in original RDA conflicted with the LRM model. But even in those cases, the content wasn't necessarily lost. It was simply moved to the community resources section outside of core RDA. And we'll talk more about that content in session three. One other thing to keep firmly in mind is that RDA is not designed to work in preference with any particular encoding standard. RDA doesn't care if you want to create your description in MARC or Dublin Core or BibFrame or MODS or RDF or any other system. RDA can be mapped to any of these, but it is not dependent on them. As it says on the standards guidance page, the goal is to attain an effective level of interoperability between itself as a content standard and the various metadata standards used in archives, museums, publishing, libraries, and other related communities. And here we get to the heart of why official RDA looks so different. For those of us who came from an AACR2 background, where we were told step by step exactly what was required, and then moved to original RDA, where there was a similar layout with consecutive instruction numbers, the official RDA toolkit looks foreign, disjointed, and confusing. How do you know where to start? Why is everything optional when so much of it is obviously what I've all, always done? The answer comes back to RDA's goals of standards interoperability and of internationalization. RDA hopes to be a relevant standard, not only for library catalog descriptive practices, but for other descriptive communities. Those other communities may be working with physical objects or ephemera or other items that do not have the same needs or priorities as those in libraries are accustomed to, but their objectives are still very similar. They want to provide access to the resources they collect. They want to be able to share that information. And they want to be able to select an encoding system that best reflects the descriptions they are creating. There are plenty of institutions who need to describe for a mix of resources and audiences, libraries with archives, or galleries that also have a library collection. The potential advantage is to be able to train descriptive staff in the use of a single content standard and then direct them to the instructions relevant to the task they're doing. One tool, many uses. To move on towards talking about actual description, it's important to understand the language of official RDA. This can feel tiring, learning new jargon, but it is exactly the process we all go through to learn any new standard. And in a relatively short period, the unfamiliar becomes familiar as you interact with it. So let's look at some terms that are key to using official RDA. Firstly, RDA entities. Now, you will note that these differ slightly from the LRM entities. RES in LRM is very broad. It includes everything that exists. For RDA, this is too broad. There are some things that institutions would never collect and don't need to describe. And so official RDA introduces a subset of RES called RDA Entity, Entity with a capital E. This refines the everything category down to everything that is of interest to users of RDA metadata in a system for resource discovery. As an example, RDA does not tell you how to describe a concept such as happiness. You can include that concept in your descriptions, such as where it might be the subject of a work, but you won't be given instructions on how to describe the concept itself. Something else you may notice when comparing is that LRM includes the entity collective agent, but RDA goes further and provides the more refined entities, corporate body and family as well. You won't find either of these last two in LRM, but for descriptive agencies, it is valuable to us to be able to distinguish groups of people who represent families from groups of people who represent a corporate body. Note that none of these entity changes affect the underlying model. They simply refine the model for our use. An element common to both LRM and official RDA, but unfamiliar to original RDA is none of them. We also have place and time span added as separate entities too. And we'll look at all three of these in session two of this series. For now, all you need to know is that they are entities included in official RDA. So back to the terminology. When we talk about entity in terms of official RDA, 
This is the list we're thinking of. It's a finite list. You can create descriptions based on individual entities, or you can mix and match elements from different entities to create a single description. The elements are where we get to the details. So let's talk about elements. Elements provide us with the areas of interest that we might want to include when talking about a given entity. Every entity has a list of elements associated with it. Those elements come in two types, relationship elements and attribute elements. In original RDA, we saw a lot of attributes, everything in chapters two through 11, in fact. Some of those elements are now present as relationship elements to fully implement LRM. This change has little impact on what we see in our descriptions because there is no immediate impact on the encoding systems we're using, but for the underlying software, it can make a huge difference to have those possibilities available. The, the addition of an entity such as time span means that a value such as 1998 as a year of publication is no longer just four digits, but has meaning as a year as a value of the entity time span. Computer systems can then be structured to recognize the difference between the figure 1998 as the year 1998 and as 1998 as a number of pages. If you're coming from original RDA, one thing to note about elements in official RDA is that they are no longer specified as core. They are, of course, there are, of course, still elements that will be vital to a given type of description, but that isn't part of RDA itself. Instead, that will be provided by communities. A library community might insist on including the element's title proper, for example while a museum community may be less interested in that element. This is the place of policy statements and application profiles. To speak briefly of application profiles, these are a way of providing those pieces that currently might seem to be missing from official RDA. The bits that tell you that you must always include this, you should include that when it's applicable, and you should only do that other thing if these criteria are met. Official RDA provides some clear guidance on what an application profile should include, which I've paraphrased here. What RDA does not do is tell you how you should do this. Many institutions are looking at using simple spreadsheets. Kate James has used a text-based document to provide simple application profiles to inform each module of her RDA lab series. Both work just fine to give you the information you need. If you want to know more about application profiles, our own ORDAC member, Melissa Parent, has given two fantastic presentations exploring the process of writing one, both of which are available to watch through the RDA YouTube channel. And I strongly encourage you to have a look if you have questions about this particular aspect of using official RDA. In the meantime, here are some quick takeaways about application profiles. Application profiles are the name for the instructions on which elements you need to include in your descriptions. Right now, there are no publicly available application profiles to view, other than the Kate James RDA lab exercise ones, but several institutions are working on them, and they will be available before you're expected to start describing resources with official RDA. You don't have to wait for someone else to write one. If you think your institution has specific needs, then you're very welcome to write one yourself. It doesn't have to be complicated. On the other hand, you could wait to see what comes out before deciding if you need to do anything at all. Continuing with terminology, you may have come across the phrase metadata description set. This is simply a description of an entity or resource using RDA elements. The descriptions you currently create might be called records or have some other name, but they will include metadata statements that describe something. And some of those statements can be based on RDA options and instructions. These are put together according to a plan, and that plan will be found in your application profile, policy statements, and other community guidance relevant to your institution. RDA doesn't tell you which pieces to put together to create a useful description for your situation. It just says that you're likely to want to, and when you do, it gives the resulting set the name metadata description set. Moving on. When it comes to resource description, you'll see the phrases information resource and resource entities. 
An information resource is something that your institution has collected and expects you to describe. It could be a book or a portrait or a sculpture. Information resources are described using resource entities. Remember that entities list from a few slides ago? Well, the resource entities are a subset of these, specifically work, expression, manifestation, and item. There are times when it's a bit cumbersome to write them all out like that, and so they're given a name. If you see the term resource entities, these are what is meant. Note that while the focus for describing information resources may be on resource entities, it doesn't mean you can't have a description that includes values of elements from other entities. In fact, your description may well contain values which don't come from RDA at all. Encoding standards have their own requirements that sit outside of RDA, and that's fine too. It's possible for a metadata description set to be partially conformant with RDA if some, but not all, of its metadata statements are conformant with RDA. And this describes the usual situation with MARC records, because some data will be RDA conformant, but not all, and that's okay. In other words, not everything in a MARC bibliographic or authority record must line up with RDA exactly. And the same is true for any other encoding system. But if the starting point is RDA, we should be able to say that the RDA derived values would still be valid and conformant if they weren't presented in MARC. So what does this stuff about conformancy mean? According to official RDA, there are three parts to the description of an information resource to make it conform to RDA. The three work together, and you need to read and understand all three to make it work. But while it's quite a lot of text to read, the result is actually quite simple. Let's take them one at a time. First, coherent description. Every information resource can be described in terms of its values from uh, elements, from work, expression, manifestation, and item. This means in practice that there is always each of these entities present in an information resource. And the minimum coherent description specifies a minimum level of connection between these entities to be included in a metadata description set for an information resource in order for it to be considered RDA conformant. Think of this like the primary relationships from chapter 17 of the original RDA. To give a simple example, a manifestation must be exemplified by at least one item. This means in order for there to be a description, there must be an item to describe. There may be more than one, but there must be at least one. Next, minimum description. On the relevant guidance page, you'll find specific instructions are provided about minimum description for each resource entity. They provide the absolute minimum values required to create an RDA conformant metadata description set. So, as a minimum, if you're describing a manifestation, you must include an appellation of manifestation and an appellation of the work or expression that it is a manifestation of. Speaking of appellations, this is another new piece of terminology. Appellations are defined in the official RDA glossary as a combination of signs that is used to label an entity for identification and reference, which may not initially help you, but focus on that middle bit. We're talking about a label or an entity. So an appellation is just a way for you to name something. If what you're naming is a person, we might call that a name. If you're naming a book, we might call that a title. Both the person's name and the book's title are appellations. So when you see appellation, it's just about what you call that entity you're describing. In our minimum description example, we said you had to have an appellation of the manifestation. In other words, the manifestation has to have a name so you know what it is. You also need to name the work or expression that it's a manifestation of. None of this is new. This is what that primary relationship stuff from original RDA was all about. We're just using a new word, appellations, to explain how you make those connections. The third part of your conformance is effective description, which is actually a little bit circular. In order to be effective, a description must be coherent and meet minimum description requirements. 
you could have a very short metadata description set that would be conformant. In most cases, you'll probably need more than two values in your description for it to be useful to you. But remember that official RDA is not serving a single community of describers. Beyond the minimum description, what it's saying is that every other element you choose to include is the choice of your descriptive community and not prescribed by RDA. It's still very useful to include a name as the creator of a work, for example, but RDA doesn't require you to do so if your context doesn't need it. It does definitely encourage it. Add other elements to descriptions that are deemed useful for identification or access. And we're back to application profiles. RDA says you must do this minimum stuff and keeps it really minimal. Beyond that, you need an application profile to define what else is relevant to your situation. For the second part of our presentation today, we will look at the structure of element pages. At this point, we understand that element pages are where we will spend most of our time and that we will be guided there by application profiles, either one we've written ourselves or that someone else in our descriptive community has developed that we can use. I'm going to switch here between the presentation and the live RDA toolkit because it's easiest to see in the live environment. And for our example, we're going to use the manifestation element copyright date. Please do keep in mind that while we may be looking at specific pages during this process, we're not focusing on the content of those pages. For the purpose of this presentation, we're still only interested in the structure because any examination of the content has to be specific to a particular descriptive community. There is definitely a need for presentations like that, but it's not the purpose of today's talk. Okay, so here we are on the copyright date page, which is a manifestation element. If you work with published material, this is likely a familiar data element. If you work with physical objects or ephemera, perhaps it's something you don't handle as commonly, but right now we're not going to look at using the element. It just makes for a good page for illustrative purposes. Starting at the very top of the white part of the page, you'll see a download link. Every element page has one of these. It's not recommended to attempt to make printouts of every element page because the content changes over time and you would spend a considerable amount in terms of ink and paper, but it's useful to know the options there if you want to take something offline to ponder. To the left, you then have the breadcrumb trail. This tells us where we are in the toolkit. We are currently on the copyright date page, which can be found under the manifestation entity, and that's under the Entities menu. Confirming that, you then have in larger type and bold the name of the page you are on. <coughs> to the right, we then have a drop-down menu for policy statement sets. Policy statements provide guidance as to how to use information on a toolkit page, and that guidance is specific to a given community. You can set up your personal view to always display a given set of policy statements, and you'll see here that I've given preference to the National Library of New Zealand policy statements. We have the ability to switch to another set if I want to see it, such as the Music Libraries Association set. In original RDA, you had to click a button for the set of policy statements you wanted to see, and were then taken to a different tab. Here in official RDA, the statements appear alongside the text which they apply, and you choose which set you see at the beginning of the page. Any toolkit subscriber can choose to become a policy writing institution, but be aware that there is a financial cost and a significant commitment to staff resourcing to make it worthwhile. At this stage, National Library of New Zealand is the only Oceania-based policy writing institution for the official toolkit. Moving on. The next thing you'll see on every page is the definition and scope of the element. This will help you understand what the element is used for. In this case, we're usefully told that phonogram dates are also recorded under this element. Next, we see the element reference box. This box is often minimized unless you have your toolkit view set to automatically expand it. And it's very easy to skip past this in your eagerness to get to the content of the page, but Actually, this box contains a lot of really valuable information. 
just below the IRI for the RDA registry page of this element, you will see the domain of an element and sometimes the range. If there's no range, it means you're dealing with an attribute element. If the range is present, you have a relationship. Let's go back to the slides room. The domain and range help you to understand what you're recording when you work with a given element. The domain is the entity that the element belongs to. The range is the entity that the element is related to. Let's work through a couple to make sure the idea is clear. Copyright date has a domain manifestation and a range time span. This means I'm starting from describing a manifestation using the element copyright date and the value I'm going to record is going to be an element of the entity time span. Turning this into a real example, here's a manifestation I'm describing. I'll use the title proper as the appellation for that manifestation to identify it as the Thornbirds. And now I need a value for my range time span. And the value of the element name of time span is 1977. So that's a relationship element. What about an attribute element? Here we have an expression element, content type. When we look at the element reference box, we see that the domain is expression, but then there's no range specified at all. It goes straight into telling me the alternate labels. This is how I know it's an attribute element. So I have my domain, expression, but on the other side of the statement, I just have a value. It's not related to another entity. It's simply a value that will be recorded and not connected to anything. And here it is as an example for the same resource. Don't worry too much about which elements I'm choosing to use here or the fact that my value at the end is in quotation marks. My point is that if you know the domain, you know where you're starting from. And that part's easy because it will be what you're describing. And if you know the range, then you know the kind of value you're expecting to record. For the copyright date, I'm expecting a value that's a time span. For content type, I'm expecting a value that doesn't represent another entity within RDA. Right, let's move on. Another useful part of this element reference box is the alternate labels section. For some elements, this contains a name for the element that may have been used previously and has been changed. That isn't the case for copyright date, which still has the same name, but you will also always find here what's called the verbalized label. Thinking back to our domain and range, the verbalized label provides the bit in the middle that gives us a sentence. So we can say that manifestation has copyright date time span. It means you can test what you actually want to use as your value and check that it actually makes sense. To finish off the element reference box, there are a number of sections relating to other standards and documents. These vary depending on the element you're looking at. For our page here, we see a section for Dublin Core Terms, then LRM, and then Mark Bibliographic. There would be a separate heading for Mark Authority tags if they were relevant to the element. Now, it's worth noting that the Mark tag list here is not necessarily comprehensive, and it is not intended as a guide for figuring out which Mark field you need if you don't already know. Looking at the copyright date list, for example, those of you familiar with Mark might be a little surprised at the list of possibilities. The point of this data actually being here is not to help you use Mark, of course, since RDA doesn't care what encoding system you use. It does, however, mean you can use the main toolkit search box to search for a Mark tag if you're completely stuck on what the RDA element name is for what you want to record and you just happen to know which mark field the data appears in. There was quite a lot to say about that little box, now wasn't there? Speaking of little, the next important focus point is actually very small on this page, the pre-recording section. Every element has a pre-recording section, and this is the section where you can confirm that the element is appropriate for the value you're planning to record. While your application profile should guide you to the right elements, it's possible that you've ended up on an element page outside of that because you have a specific need for the resource you're describing or you're looking for something unusual. So when you get to the pre-recording section, 
the question it is answering is, am I really on the right page or is there a different element I should be looking at? In some cases, the pre-recording section can contain a recommended option, which points to the use of a different element. This is where an element has been carried over from the original RDA, but which will, at some point, be removed from official RDA. And RDC calls these soft deprecated elements. Let's look at one so you know what to look for because they're a bit subtle. Here we have an example of the soft deprecated element parallel title proper, which is a manifestation element. After pre-recording, we see that wording, the following option is recommended, and then an option that guides us away from the element. It is up to descriptive communities whether they make use of these elements in the interim period while they are still available. And many policy writing communities are currently intending to use at least some soft deprecated elements. The National Library of New Zealand has taken the view that they will not use any soft deprecated elements, given that those elements will not be available in the long term, and they'd rather not set policy that will need to be changed again at that point. But let's not get too stuck on policy statements here. What matters for now is that you can recognise a soft deprecated element when you see one. Let's go back to our copyright page. Speaking of policy statements and looking again at the pre-recording section here, you'll see that the policy statements can get a bit difficult to read when they overlap. To see the one attached to the pre-recording section, I need to click on the send to back link on the other policy statements until I can see the one I want to read. If you wish, you can click on the policy statement name, which is a link, and see a page containing all of the policy statements for that element page, but most of the time it's easier to read the statements in conjunction with the relevant text. We won't be examining the actual content of any policy statements today though, we're just focused on navigation. Next is the recording section. Again, Every element page has a recording section, which may or may not contain instructions, options, or conditions. Sometimes it's empty, just like our copyright date pre-recording section. That's not the case here, though. Firstly, we have a statement. Record this element as a value of time span, appellation of time span, or as an IRI. Well, having just looked at our element reference box, this makes total sense. We need a value that's a value of time span. And now we know that we specifically want an appellation element, a name for that time span. Then we have an option. Option boxes are in grey and are, unsurprisingly, optional. They may stand alone, as this first one does. They may belong to a yellow condition box, as this next one does. All of the options, instructions and conditions here apply to any value you record for this element, regardless of your method. Speaking of methods, let's have a look at those now. In official RDA, there are four different methods available for recording a value for an element. And an unstructured description, a structured description, an identifier, and an IRI. The definitions here are taken from the RDA glossary, so you can refer back to them at me. For our purposes today, what you need to know is that every element page will have sections providing instructions and options for each of these methods. After the pre-recording and recording headings, you then move into a heading for each of these methods. Not all methods are available or even relevant for all elements. If you think about title proper, you're never going to get your value from a pre-prepared authorized list. There's no identifier attached to the text you see on the title page or the words you hear on a sound recording. So an unstructured description is the only reasonable option. Even when all four methods are applicable to a given element, the number of options and conditions to consider under each method will vary widely. Your application profile will tell you not only which element to use, but also which recording methods you need to be concerned with and will lead you here. Policy statements will then guide you beyond that point. Before we return to our copyright date page, you may have noticed some new terminology in two of those definitions we just looked at. 
The phrase vocabulary encoding scheme appeared in the definitions for both the structured description and identifier recording methods. And a related term string encoding scheme also appeared in the structured description definition. Quite often in our daily work, we're able to find an existing form of an appellation, whether that's a name of a corporate body or title of a series. And in order to bring together resources of that series or published by that corporate body, we use a particular form of that appellation, which may or may not match exactly what we see on the resource we're describing. The Library of Congress name authorities are a significant source for many libraries, but there are other sources such as VIA for Wikidata and institutions may even have an in-house list to consult. What we record from these sources could be a structured description, such as a name with dates, or an identifier, like a Wikidata number. In both cases, the source you are taking these from is what official RDA calls a vocabulary encoding scheme. It's a list of those values from which you can select, and the values in that list have been deliberately structured. The structuring is often done by way of what official RDA calls a string encoding scheme. If you think about an authorized access point for a person, we commonly have instructions that tell us to put the surname first and use a comma followed by a space and then the first name and then another comma if we're going to add a date of birth and, and so on. All of those instructions mean that we're not really just copying what we see, instead we're changing it to fit a pattern. The changes we make are due to the string encoding scheme we're using, and then the structured value that is created might end up in a vocabulary encoding scheme. The use of a string encoding scheme isn't required to create a vocabulary encoding scheme. Think of things like the list of content types in RDA, which are just words. And sometimes we use string encoding schemes without adding to a vocabulary encoding scheme at all, such as when we put a semicolon between the name of a series and the series numbering. String encoding schemes may be dictated by an encoding system, by a standard like ISDD, or by internal practice. They just tell you how to structure what you're going to record. One more thing I'd like to cover before we return to copyright date is how to read a condition box, because when they're lengthy and involve several statements, they can be harder to understand. The trick is to imagine the word and between each statement. So for this option under the element place of publication, we have a condition of a value of place of publication that is a local place name and a name of a larger place is not present and that larger place name is necessary for identification. This AND feature can be important to make sure you're correctly interpreting the conditions you see. While we're here, another feature that appears on element pages are examples. There are four types of examples to be found in the toolkit, and you can re read all about them in the RDA introduction, but the types make sense when you see them. Here in this screenshot, we can see there is an example in the option to explain how the option should be interpreted. If you open this up, you then get that example information. Right, having finished that diversion, let's return to our copyright date element for the last time. So, as I said, the recording section is divided into sections for each of the applicable recording methods which I'll now scroll through relatively quickly, so please don't try to read as I go. We start with the section for recording an unstructured description. And then further down, we come to recording a structured description, an identifier, and an IRI. Below the IRI recording method section, we then see another type of example. Here we can see a metadata description set containing values for a number of elements, and the element we're looking at is highlighted in blue, so it's easy to find. It's important to note that official RDA overall does not contain many examples, so you can see entire element pages with no examples at all. There's an examples editor who's working on adding more, and these will be developed over time, but for now, just make use of them where they appear and don't be surprised when they don't. What you will never see is a Mark or Dublin Core or Bibframe example. 
all examples in RDA will remain RDA based and not reliant on a given encoding scheme. And here we have finally reached the bottom of our page where we find the information about any related elements, the date of the last update of the page and the alphabetical navigation buttons. In particular, you may wish to note the inverse element. All relationship elements have an inverse, frequently ending with the word of. Whether or not you wish to record a value for that inverse element is yet another decision for the application profile you'll follow. So with that done, let's sum up. As expressed at the beginning of this presentation, the intention of today's talk was not to leave you equipped to immediately begin cataloging using official RDA, but to familiarize you with more of the detail of official RDA as a standard, ahead of more detailed training on working with the elements and creating descriptions. There'll be two further sessions in this series exploring aspects from the RDA guidance that we haven't yet covered, and I do hope you'll join us for those as well. Thank you for your time and attention. We now have time for questions. And I should add that uh, you use the Q&A button um, as it's set up as a webinar. Okay, so the first question I've got is from Jonah. Uh, we've discussed metadata description sets and application profiles. How do we define a metadata scheme or schema in relation to these? Is there an overlap in terminology? Sometimes I don't know whether I should be talking about a metadata scheme, schema, application profile, or now a description set. Uh, I'm, I'm not a technical expert, but what I can pick apart of that is the metadata description set, given the way it's defined, is about RDA data. So values that are RDA compliant. And so it's it's a what what will be part of a larger description. So I, I would imagine that your metadata scheme or schema would be larger. Um, and Jamie, you can leap in if you think that would be helpful, but uh, that's that's my non-technical answer to that one. Uh, I I don't think I can say much more. Um, I believe a, a, a description set is the actual values that you choose to put together as a set, but um, application profiles um, are the set of elements that you think are required that you want to use in your description. So. Um, I, I understand uh, where Jonah's coming from, that it can all get a bit confusing, but um, a little more scrutiny, I think it'll come, become clear to you. Thanks for that, Jamie. Uh, Skulk asks, what's the best way to refer to RDA rules slash statements? In AACR2, you had 1.1b1, et cetera. Um, I... I didn't really go into any of this because it's covered so well in, in the other demonstrations. But if, if there's something you want to refer to, if you highlight any piece of text in the toolkit, you, you get a number of options. Uh, and one of the options is the citation number. And um, it, it's suggested that if you're looking at written documentation, that's the easiest way to refer to it. And so that will change with each. Uh, so the condition option will have a different citation number to the to the condition. Uh, so you can be really specific about where you're going. But on the whole, if you can hyperlink, the best way to link is actually by using the URL. Um, and so if you're writing connections uh, such as they have within the options here, you would do that. So it, it, it depends on the purpose of what you're doing, Skulk, whether, um, whether you use the URL, which will take you to exactly the piece of text that you've got, or at least the paragraph, or whether you want to use the citation number. Um, yeah. 
Okay, Rochelle says, I'm a newbie to RDA and would like to learn more, as, but as we do not do any in-house cataloging as we outsource, what's the best way to go from here? Um, well, Rochelle, welcome. Always, always happy to see new catalogers, new people interested. Uh, this, this session and the sessions in this series are introductions to the standard before you get to the actual content. And what you might find is as more resources become available over the next year, uh, it will start to fall into place because we'll start talking about this is your title and this is how you record it. This is what you do with it. And so to, to that extent, this probably is going over your head um, at, at the moment. But um, there, there are other training opportunities. There is, there is a lot on the RDA YouTube channel that you can look through. The concept series is fabulous. So yeah, have, have a look at some of those resources. And ORDAC will be looking at providing some other resources going forward. Robin asks, will there be a mapping from Mark for official RDA as there was with the older version? Uh, again, Jamie can interrupt me if, if he needs to, but my understanding is that what appears in the element reference box is effectively the mapping in the sense that you can search for a Mark tag number if you need to and see which elements that brings up. And if you're on an element page, you can look at the mark tags that have been mapped to that page. But I don't know that there's necessarily a separate thing, but Jamie might have something else to say. Go on, Jamie. Hi, yeah. Um, the uh, mark mappings that were in the uh, original RDA were um, a massive, flat HTML table that was extremely difficult to maintain. So we are looking for a better solution um, for mapping, not just to mark, but any other schema that folks want to might want to map to, like Bibframe or something like that. So that's a that's a future development that we would like to improve. Uh, that we would like to provide. Right now what you see in the element references is our best workaround um, for providing that kind of information. I'll also add to your previous question, uh, response to the previous questioner. Um, Chris Oliver has a very good book called uh, Introduction to RDA um, for the second edition as well. So um, for the revised RDA. So I would recommend that as a, 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 a short but very approachable book that introduces you to what's going on with RDA. Thanks for that, Jamie. Sure. I don't have any other, oops, it up on the wrong slide. I don't have any other, yes, I do, I have a question. Uh, Eb says, a metadata schema establishes and defines data elements and the rules governing the use of data elements to describe a resource. So RDA would be a metadata schema. A metadata statement would be the Thornbirds has copyright date 1977. A metadata description set is a number of these statements together. So the Thornbirds has copyright date 1997 alongside the Cornbirds has content type text and so on. An application profile tells me which elements I need to record in my library. Thanks, Eb. Uh, Skulk asks, is it envisaged that systems would have templates to use for description and then link to the RDA rule that applies? Um, I, I think so in the same way that some systems link to the original toolkit. Um, that, that's really a, a systems development question. The ability is there because the, the references are there, uh, but how that would get um, done, I suppose, would be done 
from vendor to vendor making decisions. Yeah, Jamie. Um, yeah, we've created the RDA registry with the specific, and it which is free and open to everyone, with the spe specific intention that it would be used to for vet by vendors to develop new applications that would connect um, RDA uh, people's work tools and their work forms to uh, RDA toolkit content, et cetera. Um, vendors have yet to uh, jump in on doing something like that. So. Thanks. Uh, Heather, you have your hand up. Um, were you wanting to speak? You can unmute yourself now if you need to. Otherwise, you can just put your hand down. Sometimes these things get bumped. I'll give Heather a moment to um, either put her hand down or unmute herself. Um, Jane says, can I share today's recording with colleagues who are unable to attend today? You most certainly can. Once the recording is made available, it will be publicly available, and that would be awesome if you would share it. Okay, are there any further questions? Just giving people a moment because sometimes as soon as you say that, someone thinks of one and starts typing. Okay, well, a couple of minutes short of the hour. Thank you again for attending. Uh, that's all we have for today. I really do hope you'll join me next week for session two, when we'll look closer at other entities, manifestation statements, transcription guidelines, and sources of information. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>